Let's go back to 1984. Akeem Olajuwon just capped off an amazing college career. He led the Houston Cougars to back-to-back -to -back NCAA championship games, but unfortunately, they would lose in both years. Some believe that Olajuwon would be the number one pick, and it turns out, he was. Then, there was another guy, I'm sure you heard of him before. Michael Jordan was a young North Carolina Tar Heel, one of the most explosive scorers in the history of college basketball. Most believe that he was the best prospect of the class and probably should have went number one. However, at the time, very few believed that you could build a team around a score-first guard, especially someone like Jordan, who wasn't known to be a willing passer when he was in college. But don't get me wrong, Jordan was the real deal. He was projected to be a generational talent in the NBA due to his sheer athleticism and fundamentals. It's just that talented centers were usually taken higher in the draft because most thought that they had a bigger impact on the game and were more capable of leading a team to a championship. In fact, all of the five previous championship teams had dominant big men. That's a very convincing list, so it makes sense why teams believe that having a great big man was the formula for success. So anyway, Jordan got drafted at number 3. And who was the guy drafted between him and Elijah Wan? Sam Bowie. Portland selects Sam Bowie, University of Kentucky. Sam Bowie, the young man who came back from a stress fracture injury, the left shin bone. How's it going folks? My name's Andy, and today we're going to take a look at Sam Bowie's NBA career. How did he end up getting drafted second, and what happened later on? What were the circumstances surrounding his draft selection? In college, Bowie played three years at Kentucky, averaging about 13 points and 9 rebounds a game. They weren't terrible numbers, but for a guy who got drafted ahead of a generational talent, you would probably expect a bit more from him. The main thing he had going for him was that he was a legit 7 foot 1. Unfortunately, that would also be a double-edged sword. In his sophomore season in college, he suffered a stress fracture on his left leg, his tibia. It was a huge deal because Bowie was forced to sit out the next two seasons at Kentucky as a redshirt and then rejoined the team in 1983. But when he came back, his numbers dropped off significantly, and he was slower, more sluggish, and not the same player he was before that injury. Eventually, he would limp his way to the 1984 draft. Back then, they decided who was going to get the number one pick by doing a coin toss between the two worst teams in the league. So it was between Houston and Portland, and Houston won the coin toss, so they were granted the number one pick. Now Portland had the number two pick. Additionally, according to Bowie himself, he said that he lied to the Blazers when they were doing a medical checkup. He said, quotes, I can still remember them taking a little mallet, and when they would hit me on my left tibia and I don't feel anything, I would tell him. But deep down inside, it was hurting. If what I did was lying and what I did was wrong, at the end of the day, when you have loved ones that have some needs, I did what any of us would have done. Basically, he was misleading the Blazers into thinking that he was completely healthy, but in reality, he wasn't. Regardless, it didn't really matter because the Blazers already knew about his injury history. They just didn't care because they wanted to draft a center. After Bill Walton's series of injuries that ended his career, the Blazers wanted somebody to fill that void. Plus, they already had a young Clyde Drexler at shooting guard. He was not yet a star, but he eventually became a perennial all-star. For all of those reasons, the Blazers felt justified in taking Sam Bowie instead of Jordan, even though the majority of the world believed that Jordan was the much better prospect. Bowie's NBA career started off pretty well. In his rookie season, he averaged about 10 points and 9 rebounds a game, along with nearly 3 assists and 3 blocks. Obviously, this pales in comparison to Jordan's 28, 6, and 6, or Elijah Wan's 21 and 12, but Bowie was still good as a rookie. Despite drawing comparisons to both MJ and Elijah Wan for the entire season, he zoned out all the noise and just focused on his own game. By the end, he was nominated to first team all rookie alongside both of them. Unfortunately, it was his sophomore season when things started to get really bad. Bowie landed awkwardly while trying to get a rebound and re-broke his left tibia, the same injury that he suffered in college. He played only 38 games that season. Then when he recovered and came back the following year, he broke his right tibia. Only one week into the season and he was done. By 1987, he was already considered as a failure. 
While Akeem and the Rockets reached the 1986 finals and Jordan was dropping 63 points on the Celtics, Bowie just watched from the hospital, constantly rehabbing and recovering from broken tibias. By the age of 25, he already suffered three tibia fractures. And then he would suffer another one. The one he suffered in late 1987 was really bad. It was a hairline fracture on his right tibia which caused him to miss the entire season and most of the next season. He underwent bone graft surgery to repair his right tibia and it was starting to look like he might not ever recover. In his first five seasons of his NBA career, Bowie played a total of just 139 regular season games. It turns out this would be the end of his disappointing stint in Portland. By the summer of 1989, the doctor said that Bowie was completely healthy now. However, it was around this time when Portland started to gain steam, winning around 50 games as their young players became stars. Especially Clyde Drexler who developed into the second best shooting guard in the league behind Michael Jordan. They started to win a lot more games and became more successful and they were doing all of this without Bowie on the floor, so eventually Portland decided to get rid of the dead weight and proceed to trade him. In June 1989, Bowie was traded to the New Jersey Nets. The Nets GM, Harry Weltman, stated, You'd have to call it a risk, but we feel the upside of the trade is far worth taking the gamble. Sam is healthy now and ready to play. The doctors say they could give him clearance to play football if necessary. You never know what could happen with any player, but he's a player who can really help us. At this point, most fans have written off Bowie, as they threw him on a long list of players who succumbed to injuries. But Bowie himself never gave up and was very appreciative of the Nets taking a chance on him. Miraculously, he turned it around and had the best years of his career. For the next four seasons, he would play 68, 62, 71, and 79 games respectively. He didn't suffer any major injuries during this stretch, only a couple of contusions and ankle injuries that weren't a huge deal. His first season in New Jersey was a tremendous bounce back year. He put up career highs in points, rebounds, and free throw shooting, while expanding his game beyond what he normally does. But as the injuries piled on and he started to get older, he realized that he needed to change his playstyle. The bumping, the bruising in the paint was not working well for his body, so he extended his game beyond that. He developed a decent mid-range shot, which kept him in the league for much longer than everyone anticipated. In his four seasons in Jersey, Bowie averaged around 13 points and 8 rebounds a game. It was a bit too late for him to reach that superstar level, but he was still a solid starting center. He even played about 30 minutes a night, the most he's played since he got drafted. As a team, the Nets were relatively successful, led by Drazen Petrovic. They would make the playoffs a couple times, but Bowie did not have any standout performances. By 1993, Bowie would get traded to the Los Angeles Lakers, where he would play out the twilight years of his career. And then he would get injured again and then retire at the age of 34. He finished his career with no all-star selections, no all-NBA selections, no major accolades whatsoever. In 10 seasons, he played a total of 511 games. Years after his career was over, Bowie became a rather polarizing figure. Not because he was a bad guy, but because his name will forever be engraved in NBA history as the guy drafted before Michael Jordan. As he got older, he realized that this was something that would always stick with him. A few years ago, he said, quote, A lot of memories run through your mind. Kid from Lebanon, Pennsylvania makes it all the way to a program like the University of Kentucky. I'm very proud. I don't feel like I owe an apology to anyone. The bottom line is, Sam Bowie was drafted before Michael Jordan and you're gonna have to accept that. And that sums up the story of Sam Bowie, the dude drafted between Jordan and Elijah Wan. The circumstances of his selection are still questionable to this day even though the Blazers have tried to justify it. And there's a lot we still don't know about the night of the draft. According to Harry Glickman, former president of the Blazers, he said, If you look back at the draft, if we hadn't selected Bowie, we wouldn't have selected Jordan. We probably would have gone with Charles Barkley. I guess they were really hard pressed on not drafting a guard. Also, according to Hakeem Olajuwon's autobiography, he said that the Blazers actually offered Clyde Drexler and the number two pick of that draft to the Rockets in exchange for Ralph Sampson. Had this trade gone through, the Rockets would have used that number two pick to select Michael Jordan. This would have given the Rockets a trio of Hakeem Olajuwon, Clyde Drexler, and Michael Jordan. <laughs> That's crazy. 
If this actually happened, we would have seen a very, very different NBA landscape. I'm not sure if the Blazers management was just incompetent and did not realize how talented Jordan was, because in either of these hypothetical scenarios, they would not have taken Jordan. It was more because of the idea that centers ruled the league and they were drafting for fit instead of taking the best player available. If they had a chance to redo the draft, <laughs> you bet they would. Thank you everyone so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.